Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about IoT. You saw this, you saw this uh, chart um, that Lila had talked about, but it really is kind of a, a progression of what we see time and time again when we talk to customers who are making this transformational shift from, um, from a perpetual hardware sale to a IoT device and understanding how do I increase my revenue. Um, on the panel, I talked a lot about how business models moving to a consumption-based, subscription-based allows you to enter into new markets without introducing new feature sets, right? So that's one kind of uh, shift in initiative by customers. What, what I also see very, very, very common, and this is where it gets hard because your culture has to shift, is this kind of transformation of revenue source from selling these perpetual devices and then moving to a subscription-based software sale. Right. I can tell you from a development perspective, if you're in the development um, area, culturally developing hardware products is very different <laughs> from developing software products. Same is true for selling them, same is true for marketing them, same is for f uh, financial um, reporting on the revenue that you're capturing and how you report. I mean, reporting and proving that you've shipped a device and it landed and it was signed for is very different than shipping something electronically and taking a million dollar check for it. Very different. Okay, so um, as you go through these shifts, what we see and uh, what I see very often in IoT is kind of five different categories. So you're in generally customers are somewhere on the scale. So you're starting with your device, you're selling the device, it's a perpetual sale and you wanna move to a subscription-based business. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's pretty easy for us to understand. Um, so the software starts driving the value for you. You're pricing the software over the hardware. And, um, and then there's these opportunities to add new additional revenue sources around the sale of the hardware, right? You want to add cloud services that add additional value you didn't add before and your competitors don't have. And then that is a new subscription service itself. So that's, an, that's another revenue stream. On top of that, as you're... As you're collecting data, you have an IoT, right? So we're talking about IoT, so we're talking about connected devices in this sense. So as you have a connected device, you're starting to collect data. Now, some early adopters of IoT are really good about transforming their business into not even device sales, but into data sales. Understanding what's going on in, um, what's going on in, a, in, a, in a certain region using devices, and taking that data and creating a new revenue source just off the data. A good example of this is Nest thermostats, right? Which um, collect at, at an aggregate neighborhood, city, town, community level what the usage of electricity and gas is to heat homes, cool homes, and being able to take that data set in an analytical predictive format and sell it not back to the consumer who bought the device to begin with, but to take that data and sell it to the energy companies. Hey, in this area, here is the usage patterns of the customers. Here's the peak demands. Here's when they go up in the temperature. Here's when they go down in the temperature. This predictive analysis creates a revenue stream completely adjacent and even a different customer set, right? So these are the goals generally when I'm talking to IoT uh, companies, they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I expand my revenue sources how do I expand who I can sell to what I can sell? And then lastly, in the third-party services, is how do I enable people to add more value to my, to my ecosystem, my IoT ecosystem, maybe delivering new um, services that are communicating to my device, maybe even allowing them to introduce and install applications or uh, aftermarket value on my device. How do I capture that? How do I authorize that? How do I get some of the revenue share from the end user buying that software and putting it on their device? So these are the, this tends to be kind of the, the generic graph where I would start with somebody to say, listen, where, where are you in this? Where, what are your plans? Do you only want to take one step? Are you planning to take five steps? How do you want to get there? Um, so talking, you know, ivory towerish about this stuff can be a pretty hard. So let's bring it to an example of the whole line of business transformation, starting from a tennis racket, a dumb device, right? Ten years ago, it was a tennis racket, it was cat gut and, and, and metal. So I, I really enjoy tennis, but now you have smart tennis rackets. So now you have a chip in there, right? You have microcontroller. The microcontroller um, can sense how I'm doing a forehand, how I'm doing a backhand, how fast, 
what is my range of motion? Am I going back enough? Am I stopping? Right? It, it's starting to collect data on me as a user of this device. That's valuable to me, right? That's why I chose this racket, because now they're introducing software for me to see how I'm using the device, the, the racket. Okay, so that's step one. Um, so that's the player software. That's, that's my new source of revenue. Oh, I find value in being able to see how I'm doing in my forehand, how it matches up, what I'm supposed to be doing, maybe have links to training, how to become better. Okay, that's great. So in an IoT platform, though, you want to start adding additional services, if you remember. Um, those cloud services doesn't necessarily have to be sold directly to the end user. So you can go to a set of tennis trainers. Now that you're a device company, right? you're a tennis racket company, you build a software team, and now you're starting to build uh, cloud-based services. Those cloud-based services connect trainers to those using this tennis racket. Well, if the trainer has access to all the data of how I'm using the tennis racket, he can very easily coach me over time what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, what should I do different. He doesn't, or she doesn't need to be in the same location as me at all. It's a cloud-based delivery service. I consume, as the end user, a training service. That, that allows uh, those training plans, those trainers, to pay for onboarding to the cloud service. It's another revenue source, a different customer, a different set of value. So now I want to monetize data, right? I'm trying to move up that, that chart. So now that the tennis racket company says, well, I'm collecting a lot of data. I have a lot of tennis players in a given city. I know how often they're playing. I know the density of tennis players. And if I take that data, I can actually take that data and start selling planning services to the municipalities who are building tennis rackets. Maybe there are a gym, uh, gyms that don't have tennis courts because they don't know the population density of tennis rackets. They don't know they're going to get a, a return on that investment. Hey, taking that data, selling it to a gym and saying, listen, here's the density of tennis players. You would be really good at doing this. Or maybe you want to do community-based um, community uh, tennis associations, right? Setting up players, have more active communities. Again, your, your ability to have that data and turn it into a revenue stream, again, opens up new revenue sources as just a tennis racket company. So the idea is, is that you, know, you start with these dumb devices, dumb meaning um, non-intelligent devices, right? non-computer necessarily driven value of those devices. And as you create this ecosystem, you're really transforming your business and you become much, 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 much bigger and much healthier uh, company by introducing these new revenue streams, these new additional values to markets and uh, different types of customers. So that's kind of an example I like about it. And, and, and uh, software monetization products kind of help every step of the way. So that's the high level um, kind of when we have discussions, we want to understand your plans. We want to understand where you're trying to go and, and what your needs to get there. I wanted to take a few minutes just to introduce uh, a product that, that Lila had mentioned on her roadmap, which is Sentinel Fit. So over the years, we've worked with many IDVs, and we have, um, one of the questions was this, uh, from Chris was, okay, you have a lot of different licensing products. How do they fit together? What's, what's kind of the plan for them? So um, we have this back office system, EMS, Entitlement Management System, and, and this is built in such an agnostic way that it works with our various uh, licensing technology, our runtime technologies, as well as our cloud-based infrastructure. Um, and it can do that with our licensing technologies are homegrown, a third-party commercial uh, a licensing system itself. So Sentinel Fit is a representation of a licensing problem where our customers would come to us and say, listen, I'm, I'm building a device, a machine. Maybe I'm even putting logic on a microcontroller, right? As small as this, I'm building a smartwatch. And I want to do feature-based licensing. It's very popular. That's where everyone starts. I want feature on demand. I want to get to market with this set of features, and I want to try to upsell those features over time. And I want to be able to introduce new features and give trials and allow customers to upgrade them in the field. Okay, so that's a very basic problem set. Um, but if, if your device or machine or the logic or the software you're trying to control has uh, restrictions on how much RAM, how much disk space, what operating system may be there, maybe it's a real-time operating system, maybe there's no operating system in a microcontroller example, how do you do that? So we went and said, ah, well, we're the licensing experts. We can certainly do this. So we built a, a platform, Sentinel Fit, 
which is a runtime made specifically for these environments if you don't have an operating system, if you do have restrictions on, on um, your memory and, and disk space. So what it really helps you do is it's designed specifically for this highly constrained environment. Sorry for the product pitch. It's, it's in the afternoon. Um, it, it has a very low uh, resource consumption. Um, it, it's by far, by far, by far commercially available, the smallest commercially available runtime you can find out there. So if you're doing logic on a microprocessor, if you're doing licensing for, for a machine that you really need to get down there, we built the right thing for you. Um, it's highly portable. So in, in, these, in these environments, one of the things that can slow down an implementation is, listen, I have 10 different hardware platforms. They're all using different operating systems. I'm using hardware and resources that, hey, I'm the only one in the industry that knows about it. Can you port your stuff to ours, our, our platform? And we say uh, generally, well, we built a, a something that is where we deliver source to you and you compile it for your target environment. So we're giving you that capability to do the customization, really speeding up the implementation for you and getting to market more quickly. Um, we built it in a very modular way. So again, this, this focus on constrained resources, um, often the more features you have, the more big the product gets, right? The more memory it needs, the more disk space it needs. So we built it from a sense of saying, um, we understand as this product evolves, we also want to add new features into it. So we're built, we built it in a very modular fashion so that as you remove feature sets for it, the, the consumption of memory, the consumption of space goes down, down, down. So you can custom tailor fit it for your environments. Um, it does feature-based licensing. We talked, we talked about the feature on off already. I don't need to go into too much detail, I think. Um, Tamper-proof licenses. I mean, one of, one, of the, one of the categories of why many people go to commercial-based licensing is, oh, if it's, if it's a homegrown, it's, it can be easy to emulate. It can be easy to copy. It can be easy to manipulate. And I want to prevent against that because every, every dollar saved in piracy, right, and somebody using it uh, for their business without them paying is money out of your pocket. So um, we have crypto experts. We have one here uh, today with us, Mitsu. Um, who, uh, this is their full-time job, so we, uh, so these are tamper-proof licenses, uh, leveraging the latest kind of cryptography and cryptography infrastructure to support that. Um, preventing fingerprints, of, uh, let's fast forward to that. Okay, so one of, one of the, one of the ideas of licensing is not just how does it control the application on the device, on the, on the client, it's really about the life cycle. To, I mean, you've heard it time and time and time again the last two days. Uh, end user acceptance, this concept of now economy. Um, I, Jam just talked about the App Store experience. Everyone wants the App Store experience, whether they're buying consumer or for business. So this, this back-end automation, how do, I, how do I activate licenses? How do my users know what licenses they have? How do they update licenses? Is it in an automatic renewal fashion based on a subscription? Maybe. Maybe you have features that turn, um, that turn off if the device doesn't connect and get a re, uh, refreshed license. So maybe you have three features and uh, two of the features require every month for the device to connect. So you can push down updates, you can ensure the integrity of configurations of the device. Um, so this is what licensing in the back office system does for you. Um, the management of who's bought what, again, it's very important, and in, in I hear this a lot, is, you know, I'm selling device, I really want to know who that end user is. I want to be able to open up these new revenue sources, and I can only do that if I understand who, it's, who the device is actually getting to. Um, so as you're selling through the channel, you want to be able to c capture registration information of the end user. You might want to be able to understand which channel is activating more than others, why, where, who, etc. And lastly, something that, uh, Lila had spoken about and touched on, which is production control. Very, very often, it's my experience, and is you go to, um, as a device vendor, the, the hardware commoditization makes most of us produce our equipment and assemble the equipment in third-party co contract manufacturers. So if your value is moving to software out of the hardware, how do you know and trust a third-party contract manufacturer that they're only going to produce 10,000 copies of your software? How do you know that? They're in an offline production in China. How do you know that they're not just, at the end of the day, 
running 10 more thousand and introducing those devices on the black market without paying you for those devices. If you've ever, um, so you want to introduce production control because we don't trust inherently our full scale production of manufacturing goods. Uh, in the world today, it's, it's, it's not as common. Um, so we've, our product portfolio is really focused on security and protection, licensing and usage, usage entitlement management. Um, I'll talk briefly, what, how am I doing on time? Okay. Um, the three major benefits of licensing for devices um, is really more focused on the device. It's really helping you to monetize the software investments that we talked about uh, in previous sessions, the packaging, right? Understanding what the price, what the value is, is as important as delivering additional value. Um, so pa that packaging problem is, is really the core of licensing. Um, reducing the cost of hardware variations becomes simpler stock, simpler operations, simpler uh, fulfillment processes. And, and really as one of the things on the mind for product managers, especially in, in hardware companies is, okay, so I'm now gonna build a software team. I'm gonna invest in that software team. When do I realize the return on that investment? How do I get that return on the investment? So I, I see it com time and time again where, okay, it's great, you send the product out, version one, great. But now you're going to introduce features. You're going to build features. You're investing in a software team building new features. How do you get the return on that investment without having to ship out version two of your hardware platform? Okay, that's, that is exactly what licensing does. You come out with the new version. You deliver it to all your customers. You push it out to your devices. You have a trial license, and you incent people to upgrade. Right? That is the immediate capture of your investment once it hits market is through uh, those systems through the delivery of the software, the activation, the upgrade, the upsell of that, and the billing components. So that's really what licensing does. From a back office automation, so we talked a lot about uh, process automation, optimization of business processes. So the first is, again, understanding who your customers are, um, getting the customer-centric data. So uh, how many customers bought the, you know, the good, better, best uh, packaging strategy? Is your good the best? you know, is the most popular, is your best the most popular, gold, silver, platinum, whatever that is. Um, how do you see an aggregate of, across your customers of that? How do you control your manufacturing process? Who has allowed to produce what? How many times? How many units are actually out there that are functional units um, at any given time? That, that's, a, that's a question that many people can't answer. Um, controlling your sales distribution, controlling how many they can produce, what can they produce. Maybe they can't produce the premium product. Maybe you have uh, different tiers of distributors. And then um, a future looking feature for us is you can imagine that these devices are connected, right? And we talked a bit about cloud-based licensing where you have these capabilities to really instantly interact with the rights that a person has, both their usage and being able to turn on and off features. Um, and allowing that user from any kind of node to interact with their license. Well, if you can imagine that the backend system has provisioned the software, they knows what version the software is out there, they knows what's turned on and off out there, knows who's it, knows uh, how often it's being used. Well, it doesn't take a, uh, a genius to think, well, the next logical problem I want to understand is, what is the state of the device? What's the health of the device? Maybe I want to do remediation on it. Right? Um, maybe the uh, one problem Lila talked about, maybe the integrity of a configuration of my device has been modified in the field. Maybe a technician did modify that casino, you know, uh, casino payout uh, algorithm or configuration. I want to know about it. I want to be able to remediate that. Maybe I want to push a new version of software. Maybe I want to turn off the license. Maybe I want to uh, force a sales call for it. I want to have an uh, automatic notification to my sales team. Hey, they're going over their rights. Do something. So we talk about this in a device health reporting mode back to our back office system. Um, from a security side, uh, security is, is definitely an interesting topic in IoT. You're getting more and more news uh, how devices are being uh, misused and becoming spam bots, right? Refrigerators spamming everyone in the neighborhood, um, telling them they're princes and asking for money. So. One of the things that is our kind of DNA in the DNA of Jamalto is this security pedigree in our security background. So it's really important for us to focus on technology, really protecting your IP, protecting your IP from modification so it's not doing something it shouldn't be doing. 
um, protecting your IP from IP theft and trade secrets. So uh, many, many uh, clients of ours are concerned about competition coming to market with essentially the same goods uh, in this world of, in this world of uh, hardware commoditization, software, right? And intellectual property is very, very important. Um, we talk about uh, a manufacturing control. I talked about that in the trust. And introducing low-cost uh, counterfeits, so taking your software and maybe putting it on non-premium hardware and selling it as the product. I mean, uh, if you've ever been to China, you can get an iPhone that's not really an iPhone, right? Um, so we want to protect against that. Two, two things that are on our minds about um, forward-looking uh, features is uh, today in our product set, in our back office, we have a, a very rich story around the ability to deliver software to clients. So what are you entitled to from a software delivery standpoint so that we can, uh, the entitlement just doesn't say, hey, what did you, what did, can you use, but what can you also download? What software should I download? What versions of that software should I download for you? So you can imagine in a device world, you want the same thing, right? I'm introducing new firmware. I don't want to download all the firmware, all the 10,000 different deliverables I'm delivering across my devices. I want to do a thin line version of it. So you can imagine that that's the next logical step for us. Um, to uh, leverage that same infrastructure to de deliver secure firmware updates. And as I talked about integrity, right? The integrity of applications, the integrity of systems. Um, you want to ensure that your product's doing what it's supposed to be doing, not, not modified in the field. And, and what can you do when you've uh, discovered that it's been modified? Um, that was kind of my high level overview. I ran through it because we don't have a ton of time. Um, I'm willing to take questions. It's more kind of a mouth wetter to get the, your appetite, you know, appetizer, get your appetite moving for future conversations. Um, happy to take questions. Do we have time, I assume? Okay. Any questions? Yes. Oh, wow, great question. Um, abso absolutely, I think, I think the security, yes, uh, the, the question was, was um, with the introduction of, of and the visibility that devices are being, mis connected devices are being misused and uh, taken over control by people who want to do bad things with them, do we see security as a fundamental pillar of brand? Is that, is that fair? Yeah, okay. Um, so absolutely, I mean, uh, what is brand? brand? Brand is an expectation of value and an expectation of, of quality. Um, so I absolutely think that if, if, you, if you are buying um, a low cost device, right, that you order on Amazon because you can find the cheapest price on Amazon, and that's the device in the reviews that, hey, you know, my refrigerator emailed everyone in my community. There is, no one wants that as a consumer, right? No one wants, and especially in the business world, if, if you feel like you're buying devices to do business and those devices are gonna start doing something out bounds of what they want, then that's a really, really big brand problem. So I do believe fundamentally that security for IoT devices is a, is a brand kind of pillar. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be applied to these devices so that when you're making a decision, you're informed whether it complies with it or not. Today, most people have no idea what kind of security capabilities a device might have, and it's probably not on their list of features. Yeah, our, our list of are in software monetization. So Jamalto has has many different business units, right? Focused on different problem sets. And in software monetization, in terms of the the slice of security we focus on, is making sure the product does what you want it to do, right? And making sure that the person using the device has the rights to use it. And and what rights do they have? They don't have full set, subset, etc. Um, so so that's really where our focus is. We, we don't focus on um, firewalls, for example, for um, 
uh, intrusion detection for uh, communication overloading, et cetera, like this. This isn't, this isn't our core focus. So that is what our focus is. It's OK. <laughs> or did, did you have any follow-up question to that? To actually evaluate the security of a device. Sure. And if you're looking on Amazon or someplace else, if there were some kind of international standard on the security uh, requirements, you could easily see whether this device complies or it doesn't comply, and then you could make an informed decision. But right now, there's a vacuum. There is no standard. There should be. I wonder if Jamalto has an opinion on that. Me too, Yuna. Our CTO. Well, <laughs> much smarter than you. Nah. So, well, I think you also have to look at some of the different verticals there, yeah? Though there are definitely verticals where there are initiatives to do that. For example, if you look at the uh, Industrial Internet Consortium, there is definitely an initiative to put security as a certain standard framework in place, yeah? So, we are, well, also looking at that, if we want to, well, actually leverage something there, we're not extremely active there because at least the software monetization side doesn't see themselves as a, well, the full, well, security provider for devices in a certain, well, vertical, yeah. So we seeing somehow what, what Todd was putting there also about this, well, about the health of the device, somehow what is relatively reachable for us that we are adding additional logic there to the application to the device there that we when we see when we see something there that is suspicious that we eventually could be reporting that home this is yeah so i think in the, on the consumer side i'm not really aware of something decent actually happening there Do we, th wow, that was loud. Do we think that consumers care about security? In other words, this last hack, let me just go on a little bit. This last hack that took place, a lot of cameras were taken over and uh, they were aimed at dying and the DNS servers went offline. And if I had a home camera and my camera was working fine and I, I didn't notice any difference and you know at some point it got fixed and so why do I care? <laughs> okay, um, in, in a consumer world is different than a business world, right? A B2B application or device is definitely different from a B2C. I, I would kind of tie that into the first question about brand, right? If, if you are putting, uh, so uh, I have a two-year-old daughter, right? And we, when we go out, we want to tell the nanny that we have a camera in our house, right? Because we don't trust uh, somebody off the street necessarily. I'll let you speak in just a second. Um, so as a consumer, I really care about the camera that I put in my house to not be able to be seen and streamed on YouTube. I really don't want <laughs> that kind of stuff going on. Um, and, and so for me as a consumer in that space, I want a brand protection for that. If it's a toaster that's putting you know, the weather, uh, toasting the weather onto my slice of bread, you know, what do I really care as a consumer? So I think it, it is brand specific. You have a comment on it? Well, I was going to, you know, kind of uh, piggyback on what that gentleman was saying. And the consequence of what he's saying is if the person who's buying the, the service or the product doesn't care about how it's used, then who's, who's going to solve the problem and what's going to be the motivation of the problem? Now, you went on to make an argument that the person buying the camera does care about a specific type of security, that their, um, their video footage doesn't end up on the internet. But they may not care if they're camera is being used to launch a denial of service attack, right? So I think, I think the consequence of the question this gentleman is asking is, is um, if, the, if the person purchasing the product doesn't care about the, the bad, what the bad actor is doing, then where's the motivation in the ecosystem to get the problem solved and where do you solve the problem? Yeah, I think uh, it's, I'll answer it from, so I, I have a very strong, uh, background in security, and one, in one of the foundations of, of security principle and security theory is that the cost of protection shouldn't be less than the cost, or shouldn't, uh, the cost of protection shouldn't be more than the cost of loss, 
right? The cost of the risk of not having the security in the first place. It's the insurance model. It's cheaper to, you know, it's the recall model when you have a, a faulty tire, right? And you start killing people. Yeah, killing people is tragic. But sometimes it's cheaper just to pay them off and not have this, you know, premium product because it's a, it's a cost to price, uh, cost of the negative outcome to the price of the protection of that in any business. It's, it's this way. And so in a consumer model, it's really the goes to that cost in the mentality and the, the psychology of the consumer. Is the cost of what can go bad more, uh, more uh, expensive than the cost I will pay as a premium for the security infrastructure itself? So I would pay more, right? If I was looking at Amazon, looking at two different home cameras, I'm going to pay more for the one that I know has a higher rated uh, security platform or a higher rate security brand, because me as a consumer chooses that. But I think there's a general problem if the device somehow cannot cause harm to you, but it can cause harm to somebody else. And it's still not in your interest. And that's only, I think, about, maybe about education of the society perhaps. So, so just, obviously I work in a company that solves network problems. Right. So my brain immediately says, oh, this isn't an end-user problem, this is a network problem, right? The person who's managing the network has to solve this problem. Just as one, I'm not saying that's the only answer, but as one potential answer in the option space, you know? I'm sure you don't want to hold on to it. <laughs> you don't want to hold on to it. <laughs> so I think one of the challenges is that, uh, I mean, maybe 20 years ago, the disk sanitization issues started coming up. And there were huge penalties that were, could be, applied to companies whose data, who lost your data or allowed your data to be exposed. And in this world, in the IoT world, it's, there might be an individual person that is doing this that you may not even ever find how it actually happened. If the fines and things were implemented to the manufacturers, say, of the refrigerator or whatever device, I think that would start being able to, to curb some of that. But the problem is that it's not always a, an entity that you know that you can go back to. So I think that's part of the problem. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think this goes back to kind of the consortium conversation that or Mitsu had brought up. There, there are certain consortiums that are trying to uh, dictate how devices talk to each other, how they know they're good, how do you not um, introduce malicious infrastructure changes, right? Um, one, of the, one, of the problem, uh, one of the problems I see, you know, you, uh, it wasn't so long ago that Yahoo just admitted that millions of users, right? Their, their email and passwords were, are out there. Well, everyone uses their email for bank account. Okay, so what worse could be out there? My credit, you know, <laughs> my uh, retirement accounts are linked to my email. My everything is linked to my email. Is there any fees? No. Did the government step in and slap them? No. The only thing that happened was their buyers, right, are demanding money back now because <laughs> they're valued less as a company because as a brand. So today that's the reality of the state, and that's just software only without devices. Thank you.